The British Archaeological Association's April lecture is given by The British Archaeological Association's April lecture is given by Carl Kinsella, currently the Shuffrey Junior Research Fellow in Architectural History at Lincoln College, Oxford. Dr. Kinsella is an architectural historian with a particular interest in the representation of buildings in text and image during the High Middle Ages. The work of Richard of St. Victor, Honorius of Autun, and various religious thinkers of the period is central to his research. He holds a DPhil from Oxford for a thesis on this subject, which he's reworked into a book manuscript to be published in the near future by Brepols under the title Plan and Elevation architectural imagery in the 12th century. His lecture has a similar title, Plan and Elevation, 12th Century Drawings of Architecture. It's most unfortunate this, this lecture could not be delivered in London in the normal way, but the silver lining in this, there's always a silver lining, is that a recorded lecture has the potential to reach a wider audience, and we hope it does. The association is very grateful to Dr. Hello and thank you for everybody for choosing to tune in uh, to listening to this uh, British Archaeological Association's talk uh, on plans and elevations in 12th century Europe and specifically in France. Before I start I just wanted to thank uh, John and Lloyd for asking me to give this talk a little while ago and for Meg for showing me how to actually record these this lecture via PowerPoint, which I never knew was possible. I'm very grateful, uh, and I only hope that uh, I can meet you all at some point in the near future when all this is over and done. Okay. For the next while, I'm going to talk about Richard of San Victor's commentary on the book of Ezekiel, known as In Visionum, Ezekielus, its Latin title. It's one of the most innovative biblical commentaries of the 12th century. Not uh, only does Richard approach the biblical text searching for its literal meaning, which is very unusual at this point, he also included 13 plans and elevations to reinforce the very truth of his arguments. As we'll see, architectural drawings were particularly rare at this time and to have so many contained within a single work is, is truly unique. Their drawings themselves are precocious examples of, of architectural drawings, filled with original methods for describing the, the form of a three-dimensional structure on the surface of a page. At some point, I think we can honestly say that these are very much the not the birth of architectural drawings, but certainly we see somebody struggling trying to represent a three-dimensional structure and to some degree successfully and echoing uh, the approaches that we, we take even today. So <clears throat> in Visionum Ezekielus, this, this text itself is not contained to a couple of rare manuscripts. This is not an esoteric text by any means, but appears in 22 copies and two fragments, indicating a somewhat popular work that spread throughout Britain and France during the 12th century and the 13th century as well, in fact. And while Richard was an Augustinian canon, which I'll go into in a second, Copies of the work appear in college libraries, Cistercian and Benedictine houses as well. And it certainly implies that there was a broad interest in the subject at this time. So to give you an overview of what uh, we'll be talking about, my approach is to speak rather generally about the material and then choosing to focus on particular sections and examples to draw out some of the more interesting aspects of the commentary. First, We'll quickly go over Richard's background and what was distinctive enough about uh, 12th century San Victor, so much so that the commentary uh, could be written there. Then we'll spend a bit of time looking at uh, early architectural drawings to give a sense of the type of visual strategies that were used up to the 12th century. Uh, and we get to see how authors and artists struggle to represent three dimensions at this time. Then we'll take a closer look at three aspects of uh, the commentary. There's Richard's method for determining what 
details he includes and doesn't include in certain drawings and the order uh, in which he presents his material to make his reading as effective as possible. The elevations for the gatehouse that join the different parts of the temple complex are some of the most important drawings and are thoroughly examined and used by Richard. But he seems to struggle a little uh, somewhat with the visual language at play here, especially when it comes to showing the interior and exterior simultaneously. We'll also take a look at Richard's Latin lexicon and especially his use of the term plan and what exactly he means by this, uh, a word that we, of course, know and use today. Finally, while there are plenty of possible source materials from which Richard probably drew inspiration, the Jewish visual material was probably uh, particularly important. And I want to quickly look at that and highlight uh, it. So when I was an undergraduate, I learned, I dare say, like a great many of you, that there are effectively no real technical or architectural drawings before the 13th century. All histories of the subject um, mention Vitruvius in the first century BC, as I'll go over in a second, uh, but really get going when it comes to the 13th century, and especially these uh, Via de Encore's uh, portfolio of architectural drawings and different figures from the beginning of the 13th century, or around 1230 or thereabouts, maybe a little bit earlier than that. But this puzzled me because Viard is very comfortable using the type of visual language that we recognize today. Plans, elevations, sectional elevations. Here on the right, he's shown the width of the walls, but he's also included the, um, the, the vaulting, uh, the ribs uh, on the vaulting as well. So he, he it's a very confident use of the type of visual language that we recognize as, say, in an architectural drawing. So if this is where architectural history begins in historiography, and Viard is obviously very comfortable using it, there must be a sort of proto-history of uh, the subject, a sort of hidden um, uh, development that leads up to Viard that we've, we've missed or is, of course, uh, no longer extant. And this question has always interested me, and it's this question that's kept me interested in thinking about Richard's work in the way that I will be discussing today. San Victor itself was an Augustinian abbey situated on Paris's left bank, about a 20 minute walk southeast of Notre Dame Cathedral and a little outside the medieval city walls. Uh, it no longer stands today. If you go there today, there is a cafe uh, right there, the Cafe San Victor, which I don't recommend going into. Uh, but the abbey itself was destroyed in the aftermath of the French Revolution. It was established around about 1109 by the former head of the cathedral school at Notre Dame, William of Champeau, who wanted to prove his piety. It was then given royal recognition in 1113. Uh, so this fine pedigree uh, allowed it to expand relatively quickly and become particularly known for its educational program, which is quite distinguished even in the context of the sort of vast uh, expansion of uh, humanistic thought during the 12th century in Paris. Importantly, it comprised an open school as well, so a lot of people could go to Paris and study there without joining uh, the uh, um, abbey itself. Um, and it was certainly one of the best known schools in Paris during this time. Richard himself was born in Scotland, but probably moved to Paris at a relatively young age. He traveled there probably uh, before 1141. Hugh of St. Victor, so the school's most famous uh, uh, um, member, died in 1141. And it's seems likely that the intellectual uh, debt that Richard owes to Hugh certainly implies that he met him at some point, even towards the end of Hugh's life, although we're not terribly sure about that, but, and there is some disagreement. Um, Richard is known best for his work on mystical theology, but he was acutely aware of the importance of history to the biblical exegete. For Richard, and indeed for pretty much all victory authors of the 12th century, it was very important to understand the literal or plain or historical meaning of scripture before you could go on to expand uh, the spiritual or allegorical or moral dimension of, uh, of scripture. You had to be certain of this literal meaning. You had to be certain of exactly what people, what events, what objects were being described. 
And only then can you use that as a foundation. That's the word he uses as a foundation for further exegesis. And even choosing to tackle Ezekiel's vision was a bold move on Richard's part. There are two substantial visions in the book of Ezekiel, uh, and there were not very many uh, attempts to provide a commentary on Ezekiel before uh, Richard did his, simply because it's so difficult to do so. Richard is primarily concerned with the second vision that runs from chapters 40 to 48. And here the prophet sees a vision of uh, the temple uh, surrounded by three atria on the top of a mountain and, and also the side of a mountain. When he sees it, he's met by a man with a brazen complexion who carries a measuring rod. And this man escorts Ezekiel around the different parts of the temple complex, measuring those parts and gives those dimensions to the reader as well. According to the prophet, the overall appearance of the temple complex is a large arrangement of buildings set on the side of a mountain with the temple itself on a plateau. There were three concentric square atria, more or less square, each of which uh, are set aside for different people and retain the liturgical functions of Solomon's uh, temple, which was built earlier and was destroyed before Ezekiel's time. The largest atrium encompassing the, in, in the whole complex is 600 cubits square. The middle atrium is 500 cubits and the smallest one on a flat surface is 100 cubits. The middle atrium holds the altar used to make the sacrifices and this atrium's western side opens into the temple's vestibule. The temple itself has two rooms on the ground floor, a larger one called the Sanctum and the smallest called the Sanctum Sanctorum, so the Holy of Holies. There are gatehouses on three sides of each atria that facilitate movement between the different parts, both Ezekiel and Richard describe them in some detail. Ezekiel's account is impressionistic, filled with the sizes given in cubits, but it's often confusing and difficult to follow. One is never actually sure which parts are being measured and the exact meaning of the architectural elements that Ezekiel refers to. In fact, Gregory the Great pointed out that the vision is so confused that uh, the prophet describes a door wider than the wall to which it was supposed to be attached. And for Gregory, this wasn't a mistake. This was a sure sign that Ezekiel's words could, were never intended to be taken literally, only allegorically. But as I said, enter Richard. And he, like all Victorian scholars, believed that man's inability to understand the literal meaning of scripture was a failure on their part, not, of course, the divinely inspired authors. And he takes some time to, to write that people thought him foolish to undertake this project in the first place. But he, he promises us, ultimately will show uh, them to be wrong. And importantly as well, um, Richard says why he includes the drawings in the first place. So in, say, Viard's uh, portfolio, we don't know why they're there. But Richard is very clear about this. He tells us that everybody, no matter how simple, and that's a quote, I'm doing air quotes uh, right now, could understand his argument. So at the end of the 12th century, uh, Peter the Chanter, a well-known theologian in his own right, criticized the inclusion of the drawings in In Visionum Isaacalis, believing them to be too much of a wasted effort and probably expense. And so we know that despite Richard's stated reasons, um, including such an array of visual material was somewhat controversial and probably required immense intellectual effort from Richard, which may partly explain why the work in fact was never finished. It ends with a sort of interlinear gloss uh, uh, of the final chapter of the vision, chapter 48. And he sort of loses steam uh, when it comes to doing the drawings as well. Uh, with a, a lackluster uh, representation of the altar, which ends up being very confused in some of the later copies. So we know why they're there. Why they're there so that everybody can know the truth of Richard's argument. Um, and that's why we get them in the first place. But before we go into a bit more detail about what those drawings offer themselves, I just want to offer a bit more context showing just how unusual it is to get Richard's drawings in the first place, considering the relatively few examples uh, of the type that we have before the 12th century or even in the 12th century itself. So we know that there were um, architectural drawings in antiquity because 
in the first century BC, Vitruvius, in his treatise De Architectura, describes in the section on the education of the architect three types of architectural drawings that he calls ichnographia, orthographia, and scenographia. And from his descriptions of them, they would correspond to plan, elevation, and a drawing, say, that uses perspective. And we get an indication of something like what Vitruvius had in mind, at least when it comes to ichnographia, so that there are plans. This, I've shown a few fragments from the Severn Marble Plan, or the former Urbis Romae. This was a monumental uh, uh, inscribed plan on stone that was 18 metres high and completed by about 211. Um, that was uh, on an interior wall in the Temple of Peace. And it shows uh, the uh, plan of the city of Rome with the columns and the walls uh, represented using single lines or sometimes double lines. Um, so it, it, I mean it's broken up so we don't have uh, and whether Vitruvius would have definitively identified this as an ictography I don't know but they did exist in antiquity and this tradition certainly continued on into late antiquity and into the early middle ages. As an interesting example of how this tradition continued on into late antiquity and certainly was received by the early Middle Ages, uh, I wanted to show this one, which I uh, don't get to air out very often, but I find absolutely fascinating. This is a mosaic uh, from the late 4th century or early 5th century that's housed at the Musée Aquitaine in Bordeaux. And it supposedly shows the uh, Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Now the date for this is quite interesting because if it is from the late 4th century that would mean that it was made only a few short decades after the actual construction of the rotunda uh, at the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. So quite a short transmission period and is definitely worthy of more study. Uh, I could talk for days about this uh, mosaic in and of itself but I won't. What I wanted to point out is just how uh, interesting the way in which the artist has gone about representing the different spaces. So at the bottom half, uh, we have these three concentric circles which represent the rotunda. The tomb of Christ uh, would have been in the middle. And we can compare those three concentric circles with these, this plan of the sepulchre as it provided on the, on the right. And we see they broadly overlap. Now perched rather awkwardly on top of that rotunda on the mosaic on the left, uh, we have an elevation of the Martyrium Church, this uh, basilica uh, that was uh, a separate building to the rotunda, but certainly in close proximity to it. We have a gable roof and then a cross at the top. Those semicircular uh, uh, shapes uh, that are just above the, the, the circles uh, seem to be the apses. And I think it is what we, what I like to call a, a hybrid view. So it combines both plan and elevation in a single picture, which is, a, as we'll see, a pretty common strategy uh, in the early and central Middle Ages. The representation of the sepulchre is probably one of the most common uh, drawings that we get from this period. This is much more uh, well known. It is uh, by Adamnon of Iona. It appears in his work called De Loca Sancta, so on the holy places. Supposedly, uh, Adamnon met a bishop who was washed up during his return from the Holy Land. Now, Thomas O'Loughlin has suggested, I think quite persuasively, that this bishop called Arculf is in fact a uh, not real. He never existed. He's a foil for Adamnon's witness uh, to the Holy Land. But Adamnon tells us that when uh, he met Arculf, Arculf in his descriptions included four drawings of buildings in the Holy Land. And this is perhaps the most elaborate of the sepulchre. Uh, Arculf did these on a wax tablet and Adamnon insists that he copied them um, accurately for us. We don't have any uh, drawings from the 7th century, so the, the drawings that come from Adamnon's time, the earliest is from the 9th century, uh, but Adamnon refers to these drawings in the texts itself, so we know that they were certainly in, intended to be included from uh, the beginning. But it's important to recognize here that maps on quite well to what we want, we will be talking about Richard's drawings is that visual uh, representations of buildings are not just uh, uh, simple 
drawings, but they fulfill a purpose. Namely, they give a rhetorical power. They give the, uh, the power of eyewitness testimony to the text itself. And as well as this, we get visual exegesis. So the ability to combine various information uh, in different parts of the Bible into one single image so that the viewer can look at this image and get a, uh, a good idea of, of lots of different things in one single glance. This is a ninth century um, drawing from the end of the book of Armagh that appears after uh, the book of Revelation. And the artist in this case has uh, emphasized the gates uh, that uh, uh, open into the celestial Jerusalem and has included uh, the information uh, that there's an angel, that it's associated with one of the apostles, with one of the 12 tribes of Israel and the um, uh, and a gemstone. And all of this information is in the book of Revelation, but the artist in this case has uh, spelled it out for us. There's no need to uh, search for it. It's all presented to us in a single uh, image. And this is probably one of the most well-known architectural drawings of the Middle Ages, the 9th century plan of St. Gaul. And I won't go uh, into too much information about this because there's lots and lots written on it. Uh, but one of the most distinguishing characteristics of it, I think, is both its large scale. It's also on display at the moment. You can actually go see it. So as soon as all this virus uh, uh, quarantine is over, I highly recommend you go to Switzerland to see it. I picked out uh, part of the cloister there on the, on the bottom right. And we see that uh, on the edges that these semicircles are, in fact, arches so it is a hybrid view just like um, we discussed in the uh, the Bordeaux mosaic this this combination of plan and elevation into a single drawing what's also interesting about the plan of St. Gaul is the language used to to, to refer to the drawing the transmissal note included with it uh, refers to the drawing as an exemplar now there's a lot of literature about what that means uh, and I am no closer to figuring out exactly what that is, but there is a diversity of uh, Latin uh, words that can refer to these diagrams, architectural drawings, uh, wherever you want to call them. And this language, I think, is very important. And when it comes to Richard, it tells an awful lot of what's happening. And then we end in the 13th century with Via de Encores as we looked at his plans. But this just gives you uh, an idea of how innovative uh, it seems Viard Id is, is in how he represents architectural drawings. On the right, I have one of my favorite uh, images in the portfolio, uh, and it shows Rons cathedrals, both the interior and exterior simultaneously. He's juxtaposed two views uh, beside each other, so you get a sort of a view that is impossible to see in real life looking at interior and exterior simultaneously. It's quite extraordinary. So, so this uh, collection of drawings that I've just shown you is in fact largely uh, the amount that we know from the early Middle Ages in this diagrammatic style that we uh, think of when we think of architectural drawings. There simply are not that many of them, which is one of the reasons why the collection in Envision of Ezekielus is so unusual. You've seen that they, they focus on particular aspects. There is one drawing of one building. But Richard has shown us lots of drawings of lots of different buildings. Um, and that, as you've seen, is unusual. So first we'll focus on a few of the drawings. We'll think about uh, the way in which he orders his material. We'll look at the uh, elevation, one of the ones you see on the left here. For the most part, we uh, are focusing on this manuscript, this Paris, Bibliothèque Nationale, Nationale Française, MS Lat 14516. And this is a very important manuscript because it was made at Saint Victor at the beginning of the 1170s. Richard died in 1173. So that probably means that Richard was alive uh, when this manuscript was made. And if that in fact is the case, that means we can assume that he took some interest in uh, its production, in the drawings, how they're represented and everything else uh, about it. So, and 
uh, unfortunately, the manuscript isn't c complete. Uh, it's largely complete, but there are some elements missing uh, from it. So, so say here on the right, we have a plan and there are no, uh, there's no notes with it, no measurements uh, in it, um, which certainly implies that not everything was completed uh, in the manuscript. Now we look at the first three plans as they appear in the commentary. I want to show you them all at the same time to give you uh, an approximate uh, uh, idea of the relative sizes they are to one another as they appear on the manuscript page. So on the left, this is the first plan as we see it in the commentary, and that is a little bit smaller than the second, and that in second one is in turn a little smaller than the third. Now, the first plan, um, is of the entire complex, the whole thing, all three atria presented together in, ironically enough, the smallest plan in the entire uh, commentary. And Richard has this very interesting way of presenting his material using the drawings in a very intelligent way. So he tells us that when he's going to be speaking about Ezekiel's building, first of all, he wants to give his reader an idea of the entire thing. So that before he goes on to the particular nitty gritty of each detail, the reader should have uh, an idea of the whole, all three atria together in their head and how they're arranged around one another and the placement of the set, say the central atrium uh, within the middle atrium here. And that is a pedagogical strategy that we will see in uh, a, a few Victorine writings. This starting, this balance between accuracy and accessibility. I mean, this plan, in fact, makes little sense as a plan of three atria because there are no openings between the atria. There's no way to get from one to the other. No representation of the gatehouses, which Ezekiel emphasizes and which Richard will go on to discuss in great detail, as we'll see. But that doesn't matter. He is focusing on the details he wants his reader to take from his drawings right now. He excludes anything that's not immediately needed uh, and simply wants them to think about the general arrangement of each of the atria. Then we go on to the second drawing in the sequence. Now we start to get a little bit more detail. But first of all, look at how it is arranged in comparison to the previous drawing. It's as if we've zoomed in slightly. We still get the three atria. So uh, the middle atrium has lost its wall width. It's right there in the center, but it is there. But now this middle atrium has been expanded slightly. So we get uh, an idea of the uh, buildings as they're arranged within that middle atrium. Now we also get um, the representation of the gatehouses, these porticus um, arranged in three sides of each of the atria. Um, and then we get uh, the uh, indication that the pavimentum, so this uh, ground that lies between all the porticus, and now we also know that there's a series of rooms extending from, as we see at the bottom, as you walk towards the central atrium, the 15 rooms, the sequence of rooms that Ezekiel describes. And then we get the most uh, detailed drawing so far. And again, look at the general view of it. Now the outer wall is taken away. We have zoomed in even more so. It's as if we ste are stepping closer to the action bit by bit. The central atrium is still in the middle there. We still have the gatehouses, these porticus arranged on three sides of it, the pavimentum uh, uh, between them. N now we have uh, the uh, gazophalacia, um, in that sort of T shape at the bottom as well. But now Richard tells us where the temple is, right there, just above the interior atrium as we see it. And it in turn is surrounded by three buildings. So there's nothing that would have stopped him from including the temple and these three buildings in the second drawing. But like in the text, Richard is taking his reader through each part bit by bit choosing what to include and what to exclude, which is just as important in order for his reader to focus on exactly what they should take out of it. He doesn't want to bombard them with information. He wants to take them through 
the buildings bit by bit, just like the man with the brazen complexion does. We also here, for the first time, get a sense of how the drawings are orientated. So if we look at the Gazufilatia, this green rectangles on the bottom half, on the left say here we have uh, the term Australum. So we know that that is the southern part and Aquilonare uh, on the opposite side, the north. Um, so now we can begin to orientate ourselves around this entire structure as I think it's important that the temple is situated where it is in relation to the viewer. It's as if we are walking towards it. We are walking towards the western end of the complex as we move towards the entrance of the temple. So I want to give a sense of the effect Richard seems to achieve here. We get a sense of moving closer to the buildings as if zooming into the middle and central atria bit by bit and getting more and more detail as we do. In the third plan on the right, not only are the temple and surrounding buildings included, but the outer wall is taken away. It's as if Richard adds and removes things to keep the viewer's attention on what he believes matters. Each of these drawings and the order in which they're presented fulfill a specific purpose. They are not ad hoc. They are absolutely tied to the text uh, which accompanies them uh, and each one fulfills a particular function for Richard. And even these simple drawings can convey an awful lot of information, especially when combined with the text. Um, they give a general idea of how the buildings relate to one another and say, if we compare it to say something like the Sangol plan with that uh, arrangement of church and cloister and all these buildings sort of very tightly contained within the spaces uh, to an unbelievable sense, Richard is and Ezekiel are, is absolutely concerned with uh, the, the spaces between the buildings as much as he is with the buildings themselves. And he gives so much information that I've heard mocked up uh, a sort of, well, literally a sketch of, uh, of this central atrium and what it looked. To the top on the on my sketch, up to the top, that is the temple, and it on on the three buildings on the on the other sides are the gatehouses. Now this isn't perfectly correct because the gatehouses are supposed to be on a slope. But if you combine the measurements given in the text with the drawings, it's very easy to um, to make something like this from the clarity of Richard's design and the clarity of the way he conveys that design visually. Up to that point, we don't get a sense that these are actual buildings. They are simply colored polygons on uh, the surface of a page. They're quite abstracted in how they present the material. But now in this fourth drawing, we are shown for the first time that they are in fact buildings. These gatehouses uh, are structures, they have roofs, they have gates, they have everything that a 12th century audience would expect from a building. Um, whereas before they were used, uh, the reader was forced to use their imagination. Here, Richard explicitly shows them as, as buildings again, building up um, that uh, visual language um, bit by bit so that the viewer uh, can be slowly introduced to, to what's happening. And of course, this, this fourth plan is, of course, a hybrid, like we saw with the Bordeaux mosaic, with the uh, plan of saint Gaul, um, and is particularly common in the early and central Middle Ages. We have the, um, the, the, the atrium wall, and then on the three sides, we have the uh, gatehouses shown in elevation. Um, now I'm showing this drawing out of order. It in fact appears after the, uh, the elevations of the gatehouse, but I wanted to give you a sense of just how detailed and literal Richard is taking his source material here. Um, this shows the uh, central and middle atrium at the top there, we have the altar. It's placed right in the center of the middle of the middle atrium. Uh, the gap just above it, that is in fact the entrance to the temple. The buildings on three sides, as I'm sure you'll see, they are the gatehouses. The river that flows out of the temple 
goes through each of the gatehouses. Now, Richard is very thoughtful here. He's trying to take um, Ezekiel's words very uh, literally. So he knows that in the gatehouses, sacrifices take place. And he also knows that if you want to sacrifice an animal, it's a bit of a messy business and that you need water in order to wash uh, the altars and wash the spaces, having done so. You'll see that the Blue River goes through the locus coquine in the gatehouse. So that is the, the, the kitchens. Uh, interestingly, these kitchens uh, should be underneath the, um, the gatehouses themselves. But Richard has presented them to the side here. I suspect this is a conceit because, as we'll see in a second, Richard really struggles with trying to portray different levels in plans. Uh, so we shouldn't really see these kitchens uh, being placed on the side of the gate gatehouses, but in fact underneath them. This drawing was uh, essentially rediscovered by Catherine Delano Smith, uh, who kindly showed it to me a few years ago. Uh, it only uh, exists in two copies of Envision of Ezekiela. So there's this one, this French manuscript, and then in the Durham fragment as well. It, we know it was in intended to be included from the beginning uh, because uh, Richard makes reference to a large drawing uh, at, at the end of chapter 12. Uh, so it's and it doesn't appear in this French manuscript that I've been using a lot. But then, as I said at the beginning, uh, it doesn't seem that that manuscript, or at least the drawings in it, are completely finished either. Uh, so we maybe shouldn't be too surprised about it. So those are the general plans of the entire structure uh, that Richard serves in order to give the reader an idea of how the whole temple complex is ordered and how it's arranged. Now we move on to the drawings for the gatehouses themselves and this comprises the majority of the uh, commentaries content. He includes five drawings in total for the gatehouse. So we have the first three here that are in plan. On the left here, top left, we have uh, the whole building. And just like the order of the plans that I discussed uh, before, he takes us through the appearance of the gatehouse bit by bit, almost to the point of it being a little silly. So on the left, we have the entire building. It is, generally speaking, a rectangle. It's not a square. It's a rectangle with a vestibule that goes right through uh, the middle of it. And that is generally shown to us on the top left there. And then he wants to focus on a particular part of the gatehouse. So he takes one half of the gatehouse and gives us the internal structure of it. So we can see that it's divided into uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, vestibules uh, with smaller rooms in three of those uh, middle vestibules as well. And then he uh, gives us that and then he gives us the entire building, which essentially just doubles the middle drawing. You just take that and sort of turn it on the side and um, you get the whole building. He, this so this certainly to me anyway seems to indicate that Richard is thinking very thoughtfully about how he presents the material, how he is sort of gently taking the reader and the viewer by the hand and leading them through uh, the visual material, just like as I said, the man with the brazen complexion did as well. To give you a sense of what these larger and perhaps more important plans would have looked like if they were completed, I've shown um, two here, both from the Bodleian. The one on the right, uh, MS Bodley 494, is a 12th century copy and is quite close to the uh, 1170s bayonet copy. But as you see, the artist here has included the uh, the different notes uh, about the measurements for it. And the notes are important because they, uh, effectively combine text and image so that the reader doesn't have to go through the rather long chapter in order to have a good sense of what this building would have looked like. They can look at it and read these small notes uh, uh, to be pretty sure about what Richard is trying to argue. And in terms of the sizes of uh, these uh, different rooms and how they're presented on the page of the manuscript, it's quite interesting that they're not scaled. So if we look at the uh, top of the uh, thalami, so uh, around here, 
we know that that width there is one cubit. So, uh, or in fact, an, a better way of doing it is say, this tells us that this end room is uh, eight cubits wide and the threshold is six cubits. So we know that the these jams here on either side are one cubit. Now, if we take that one cubit and try to scale it up, so does one cubit fit into this six cubits six times? No. Does it? Does the one cubit fit into these eight cubits eight times? No. And this, the width of the vestibule that runs throughout uh, the entire structure, uh, that's ten uh, cubits wide, and that little single cubit does not fit in it ten times exactly. However, the relative uh, proportions are quite consistent in what they're trying to do. So one cubit is always smaller than three cubits, six cubits is shown smaller than eight cubits, and eight cubits is shown smaller than ten cubits. So it's not scaled, but there is some concern taken with how the building appears on the manuscript, that it should be consistent in size. Now this 12th century uh, copy from the Bodleian is a reasonably good example of that, and not all of them do take the time to do that. Um, certainly some of the 13th century copies don't. But I think with an artist who uh, is who really wants to do this properly does take the time um, to think about how the material is presented on the page in front of the reader. So those are the plans. Now this is the same building except shown in elevation. And these are really quite remarkable drawings in a great many ways. And I could spend an hour talking them about them uh, all by themselves. Um, and well, the plans are detailed in their own way, like so many plans, they tell us very little about how uh, the building actually would have looked like if you were a person standing in front of them. Um, it tells us something about how they would have looked like if we were flying uh, on top, but little about, say, the ornament or the decoration or the style in which uh, they could be built. So here, for the first time, we see the gatehouse, but also we see for the first time that it is uh, situated on the slope of a mountain. And this is, uh, as we'll see in a moment, is very important for Richard, um, that these steps go through the, the mountain and they are on a, this consistent um, uh, um, uh, angle uh, to, to it. Um, and I don't really want to talk too much about um, the... Um, the style, it's in Romanesque, this sort of uh, round arches, this sort of very distinguished uh, separation of the different elements, mainly through colour for the most part. Um, and that is always um, used in certainly in all of the versions I've seen. There's no sort of Gothic uh, update, you know, uh, version 2.0 of this uh, manuscript. Um, so the artists and the later artists do take some concern about uh, being consistent in to Richard's vision of it. Um, uh, Walter Kahn in the um, in his uh, sort of first discussion of uh, these drawings, um, the first to really sort of identify just how important they are, uh, took this frontal elevation and thought about how it reflected similar buildings from the late 12th century. Um, I think this is rather problematic to some degree. I don't think that Richard is thinking about his frontal elevation have, from the point of view of having seen buildings that look like this. I think he's thinking about it in terms of how best to represent it on the page. I think that this central vestibule going through the middle of it is not really uh, a uh, sort of a space between two pilasters as we see here on the left, but in fact, is this is sort of like a hybrid that this is of course a, a frontal elevation, but this space going through the middle is probably in fact the middle vestibule that we saw in the plan that runs straight through the middle of the gatehouse. But what's really interesting about these drawings is in fact that this is this uh, lateral elevation on the right here is a sectional elevation and is i think one of the first uh, one that we can definitively identify from the middle ages um, if we look uh, and compare these two drawings so on the left of course this is the plan for the same building that the different uh, um, spaces here 
correspond to this space here uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and we know this because it tells us that uh, the, um, uh, the, the titulae here tells us what each of these space represents. Um, so unless this uh, wall is open to the air, and I don't think it is, Ezekiel doesn't say that, and Richard certainly doesn't say that, uh, Richard wants to show us what's on the inside of this building. And in fact, it's rather complex elevation because this ground floor on the slope is in elevation but the top is not this crenellation doesn't make sense if it was say sectioned off this has to be on the front on the sides of the building so the top here is uh, a normal uh, a lateral elevation and the bottom here is a sectional elevation um because richard because the way in which richard uh, discusses this material is by discussing the interior of the buildings um and he, so as, as a result, he needs to show his readers and his viewers uh, what is on the inside, but he also needs to show the building at the same time. So he's sort of forced into making this section elevation. But he's a little unsure about this because on the frontal elevation, it would have made sense to do something similar, but he doesn't seem to have done that. Uh, I've blown up a, a detail uh, of the frontal elevation here on the left. And we hear on the left, this line here, Citus uh, Thalami. So this is the location of the Thalamus, one of these inner rooms. And the fact that it's um, vertical tells us, I think, that this is the extent to which this Thalami comes out. Uh, so through text instead of, say, the visual section elevation, Richard uh, has shown information about the interior of the building but you have to sort of work rather hard uh, in order to know exactly what's going on. And it's not the most effective way of doing it. And certainly doesn't point to something like uh, future developments in architectural drawing, such as the use of sectional elevations. Uh, I've shown this, this is the plan of the temple simply because uh, it's, it's, it's rather extraordinary uh, uh, building in its own right. Um, and it show, and you can see, well, uh, that one of the distinguishing features of Richard's uh, text is the largely consistent nature of the different uh, drawings across the manuscript witnesses. But that doesn't always hold for all uh, manuscripts, that there are some uh, important differences between them. Here on the left, uh, the artist, uh, um, th this is an original manuscript, has in fact forgotten to include the altar, which says it's there, this altar in Shenzi, uh, but this uh, 13th century Cistercian manuscript has taken that and included it instead. So I think to some degree, we can say that the artists copying um, the different parts of the drawings um, are not doing so passively, but are thinking about the relationship between text and image and want to make sure that the images are as complete as possible. Now, I, I want to talk a little bit about the language Richard uses to present this material and the language the Latin lexicon he uses to discuss them. Um, so we talked a little bit uh, in, in relation to that large, uh, huge plan with uh, all of the details in the river going through the different parts that Richard really struggles with um, presenting uh, a plan and trying to include information about the different levels on the same buildings. And in fact, he specifically says this. So, uh, I mean, he, he says at the top, say, quite difficile, but it's actually difficult or even in fact impossible to represent the length, width and height in plan under the same figure. Uh, this is an extraordinary phrase really uh, for a couple of reasons that he calls it in plan. So this, uh, he's calling the drawing uh, a planum, um, in a plan under the same figure. Well, nobody before this uh, has called a uh, drawing such as this uh, a plan. Um, and this fascinates me. Where did he pick up this language, this, this same language that we use today to refer to an architecture drawing such as this? Uh, so the, not only is the, la the visual strategy that Richard used as precocious, but also the language he uses as well. Um, when we look for the source of Richard's use of the term plan, we don't have to go much further than um, 
medieval texts on geometry. Um, one of the most important in that subject was Chalcidius's translation and commentary on Plato's Timaeus. Now, Chalcidius's work compri comprised most of what was known about Plato's own words uh, by the 12th century. Um, and Chalcidius says that he's going to deal with what, he, as I picked out here, uh, De Planis Figura, so on plain figures. Uh, then he follows that with, he's also going to discuss uh, De Solidis Corporibus, so on solid figures as well. And if we read on, we realize that what Chalcidius is talking about are two dimensional figures, so what we call squares and circles. And De Solidis Corporibus are those that incorporate three dimensions, so uh, cubes and, and spheres. And this uh, was picked up um, during the Middle Ages, used in other ge introduction to uh, ge geometrical texts, such as those by Gerbert of Aurillac. But we don't have to look further than uh, San Victor itself. Hugh of San Victor, uh, Richard's mentor, wrote a treatise on practical geometry. Uh, and Hugh defines practical geometry as geometry that is uses uh, straight edges and compasses. Uh, so you know, you have to work with your hands in order to do practical geometry for Hugh. And manuscripts uh, of the work uh, usually include these two dimensional figures in the margins that help the reader uh, follow the text. And you know, I don't think we have to go too far to think about uh, how Richard uses this material as well by including drawings that help the reader follow along with his text. Um, so this use of the term plane figure, so when Richard refers to uh, a plane figure, he refers to a two-dimensional figure and not a three-dimensional figure. And this is part of the reason why he finds it so difficult to represent the length, width and height, so that's three dimensions in one, in one figure, he, in, in, under, under uh, the same plan. He needs somehow in order to do a proper literal interpretation of Ezekiel's words to include that third dimension. And this drawing is how he gets his reader to do that. Uh, for the most part, in uh, sort of when you read about um, Invision Ezekielus, this drawing is often overlooked because let's face it, it's compared to some of the other drawings we've seen, it is incredibly boring. However, uh, behind it is some of the most interesting intellectual tools uh, that Richard uh, takes advantage of in order to uh, create his commentary in the first place. Um, so, how, so what is happening? How does Richard include his third dimension? Well, he does it by giving two types of measurements for Ezekiel's plans, for his drawings, or for his vision. So, I'll read this because it's quite important. And there's a few different parts of Envision Ezekielus that refer to this, but I'll read this one. Uh, he says, but if the eastern path from outside the wall to the site of the temple uniformly ascends and 100 cubits lay between the ground between the two gatehouses, one will obtain no more than 80 cubits according to the plan, secundum planum. However, the surface will have 100 without a doubt. A surface might have called superficies here. So we have two types of measurements for the same space. There's a planar measurement, which is 80 cubits, and a superficies measurement, which is 100 cubits, so a little larger. So what exactly is this? What, how can you possibly have two different measurements for the same space? Um, and this is how Richard fits in everything and how he incorporates this height, this third dimension into his thinking. So, so this drawing is the key to how Richard shows how you translate from one measurement to another, how you get from a planar measurement to a surface measurement, from a planum to a superficies measurement. And that's why it's one of the more interesting in the entire text. So a plan measurement are those that assume uh, the site on which you take that measurement is flat. And a surface measurement are those that include the slope of the mountain in that measurement. So that's why it's longer. It's sloped. Uh, and, and that's why, as we'll see in a moment, that the same space that seems to be covered is in fact uh, two, is two different cubit measurements.
I'll take us through it. So first he asks his reader to draw a line with five even spaces in that line. Then he asks uh, us to draw um, another line coming up from the from the, the, the fifth space there and then separate that into three parts as well. Then you give each of those parts a letter so you can understand what is happening. Then you draw a line from A to K. And then finally you draw, my, fortunately my circle doesn't fit into my slide, but trust me, that's a circle. And you draw a circle which shows that the length of the hypotenuse, so A to K, is the same as the length from A to F, so that flat measurement, that one at the bottom there. And this is exactly uh, how we understand the superficies measurement. The A to K measurement, so the hypotenuse of the triangle, is that which is the slope of the mountain. The A to F is the planum measurement. So Richard tells us, let's assume that each of those spaces are 20 cubits. So A to F would be 100 cubits. A to K is also 100 cubits. And that is shown definitively because of the circle. We know that A to K and A to F is the same length. So we have um, a, a flat measurement and a, one, a slope measurement, a hypotenuse, that uh, looks different, but in fact is the same measurement. So we have to imagine that we are standing on top of K uh, and looking down. It would seem that uh, the our line, our hypotenuse ends for at E, so A to E, which is 80 cubits, um, but in fact it is the slope of the mountain and it is A to K and that is 100 cubits. And this drawing on the right, uh, the artist has really tried to understand what is happening there. And the little note uh, on the right there on the top of the hypotenuse tells us that that is the slope of the mountain. Now, usually when I give this presentation, uh, I tell people to come up to me at the end if you have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, I do struggle sometimes with trying to explain this, but um, it is it is all there. Um, and I encourage you to, to uh, have a look at it. So we've looked closely at certain aspects of Richard's drawings. We've seen that the order in which he presents the first three plans is very much uh, done for this pedagogical reason that he includes information and doesn't include some information in order to lead the viewer uh, gently by the hand so that they can better understand what's happening in each of the specific drawings. We've seen that he includes a sectional elevation so that both the interior and exterior can be shown at the same time uh, in one of the uh, possibly the first sectional elevation of the Middle Ages. Finally, we've seen that the language Richard uses, this use of the term plan to refer both to the drawing itself and to the type of measurements, uh, is quite innovative and derives from the use of geometry. And this geometrical influence is very important and fascinating. But we have a broader influence that I think is just as fascinating, and that is from the Jewish uh, visual exegesis and Jewish architectural representations. And we shouldn't be terribly surprised that Richard would be influenced by Jewish uh, uh, communities. Uh, Hugh of St. Victor was particularly known uh, to talk to rabbis when it came to understanding the Old Testament better. And in fact, St. Jerome says that if uh, XG doesn't understand anything in the Old Testament, they should go to the rabbis because they uh, know it best. And that is exactly what uh, Hugh did. Uh, Richard is not known so much of all the Victorines for emphasizing Jewish learning, but uh, he certainly seems to accept it as he uh, did his mentor. So this plan here uh, shows the map of uh, the Holy Land that's described at the end of Ezekiel's vision. Uh, and the separation of the different tribes of Israel within their allotted land. It, the map itself doesn't appear in all copies of Envision Ezekielis, in about half. Uh, it doesn't appear in the earliest one, this Bayonet manuscript that we've looked so much at, uh, but that manuscript, as we've seen, isn't complete. It, uh, Richard doesn't make any reference to this drawing, um, but then 
Richard's text isn't complete anyway. Um, so whether Richard actually intended for this map to be included from the beginning, I'm not so sure. But certainly, uh, as we've seen, this uh, left manuscript, this Bodley 494, is a 12th century manuscript. And uh, so we know that the map was part of the dissemination of the text relatively early in its transmission history. Uh, so certainly copyists uh, found it useful or certainly thought it should have been part of Envision Ezekielus. Um, and this, whilst Jewish-Christian relationships during the 12th century was certainly uh, declining, especially in the wake of the First Crusade and the extraordinary violence done upon Jewish communities um, in Germany and other places. Um, we, one of the richest uh, intellectual communities, um, work, uh, Jewish communities, uh, was in Champagne under the rabbi um, uh, Solomon ben Isaac, who died in 1105, who was better known as Rashi. Rashi wrote a commentary on Ezekiel, which included several architectural plans, but also a map of the Holy Land that bears a remarkable similarity, some similarity to these two. Um, so these two uh, maps uh, are, from, are taken from Rashi's commentary on the book of Ezekiel. And I think you'll agree that they are strikingly like uh, Richard's. Um, and unfortunately, knowing how this map ended up at the end of Envision Musicalis is problematic. I'm not sure we'll ever know exactly how that came to be. But as I said, it, the close ties between San Victor and the French Jewish communities uh, and the use of um, uh, Jewish learning within, say, Hugh of San Victor and especially Andrew of San Victor's work. And then later in the 13th century, Nicholas of Lyra in his immensely popular uh, uh, um, work on the commentary on the entirety of the Bible uses uh, Jewish um, examples of uh, drawings in order to show Christian readers the different parts of, say, the temple uh, and the Levite priests and, and everything else. Um, but here, having these drawings so closely tied to Envision Misikalis certainly tells us that there are Jewish elements functioning within uh, San Victor that emphasized visual exegesis within the context of a commentary on Ezekiel. There is plenty of other examples of Jewish architectural drawings, such as Maimonides, by, by the, uh, uh, Maimonides who's working in, in, in Egypt in the late 12th, early 13th century. Um, that are even more uh, probably uh, uh, precocious than, than Richard's itself. So they're functioning as part of this uh, clerical intellectual community that accepts the power of making images uh, within, um, within uh, a com the commentary tradition. There's a, an awful lot more I could say uh, about these and I've written um, I've written on the Jewish material that should be released soon enough and where I go into a lot more detail about that and the relationship between Richard, Rashi and Maimonides uh, and the extraordinary sense of visual representation and the representation of three-dimensional structures across Christian Jewish communities. Um, as I said, for the most part, I would love to uh, have a chat about these things to you all and I hope sincerely that I will get an opportunity uh, to do that. Um, I will be at the uh, BAA uh, in December, I hope. Um, and uh, to give you a sense that this is not just a disembodied voice, uh, this is me uh, on the left, uh, as I hope uh, is obvious, um, and my fabulous assistant, Roland. Um, if you have any questions about these things, uh, I can certainly do my best to, to answer them uh, if I get to an email. So I've, I've included my email with this presentation and I hope to continue this conversation further uh, down the line. Uh, I hope perhaps that uh, I've distracted you from uh, your quarantine and lockdown situation uh, for uh, at least a little while. And um, thank you very much for, for listening and um, good luck. <laughs>